we've been talking through Romans chapter one, and we've come to this really big question, which you, you've asked me about on the wrath of God, Romans chapter one, verse 18. And it really deserves a bit of careful attention. Okay, here comes the question. It says the wrath of God has appeared or been revealed against. And then the whole series of really negative stuff. And the questioner asked this, he said, where is Jesus in this paragraph? And it's a really, really good question. So let me share the screen and I'll show you a book that I've been looking at that helps me answer this question. This is Douglas Campbell's book. It came out in 2009. It's called The Deliverance of God. And I'm reviewing his idea on the wrath of God. Okay. Now let me make that script a little bit bigger here. Can we do that? There we go. There we go. Okay. The Deliverance of God. And he gives a useful idea to understanding the wrath of God. So the letter of Romans started with a very, very normal introduction, very matter of fact, hi, you know, I don't know you guys yet, you know, here I am, I'm coming to you. And some obvious introductory material. And then verse 18, as you have noted, seems to point out a kind of thesis, a starting point for a long argument that's going to be developed through through the, the whole of the letter, really. Here it is. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. And then Paul mentions that word for wrath another 12 times. Well, another 11 times, 12, including this one. It's the word orge. Sounds like orgy, doesn't it? Orge. And it's it's usually translated wrath, sometimes anger. And it appears right the way through the the letter to the Romans. But only this first time do we have the construction or gay theo, the wrath of God. And the other 11 times it just says or gay wrath by itself. And you might argue that's not what it says in my Bible. Well, we'll get to that. Give me a minute. The idea that Campbell brings out is that Paul is actually challenging the idea of orge. He's reworking it. He's giving us a new understanding of it. And that's why we come to what you asked, right? where is Jesus in this paragraph? That is how he's working out. Because, of course, you know, just to put it very, very simply, how do you reconcile the wrath of God or anger? How, how does that work out really with the for God so loved the world that he gave? You know, how does that work out? Because we know that the gospel is not transactional. It is transformational. It is not a, an equation that has to be met in such a, a wooden fashion as that you know, X equals X plus Y, you know, it's not an equation, it's a relationship. So how does orge and the love of God come together? That's what we're going to look at. Okay, but 11 times it just uses the word wrath because Paul is addressing this very point. That is to say, he's talking not, he's talking about what we do and not what God does. Okay, and this is not Campbell's idea completely. It comes from Hamilton Kelly and James Allison and many others. But Campbell takes it a little bit further, and this is the good bit. He says the wrath of God in chapter 1, verse 18, doesn't reflect Paul's teaching, but expresses an opposition perspective. That is to say the wrath of God is how Paul's opponents speak. Do you remember when Paul went to Galatia and he had a terrible fight with people who were trying to bring a basically an Old Testament idea of of religion and then paste it onto this new thing, this gospel, this Jesus story. So he's he's 
So he had to challenge them when, when Peter came to Antioch, I withstood him to his face or that which we, he was doing was, was wrong. I had to withstand the, the, the overemphasis on Old Testament sacrifice because we have something new here. The gospel is brand new and it is transformative. And the justice it brings is transformative. It's not retributive, it's not punishment. It is transformation, it's change. In Jesus Christ, I'm a new creation. So when he speaks in uh, Romans 1.18 about the wrath of God, it doesn't reflect Paul's teaching, but the opposition point of view. And Campbell argues that the only thesis which solves all the questions about the reason for Paul writing Romans when he did is that he had to make a preemptive appeal against the same kind of teaching that was beginning to come to Rome in the same way that it had come to Galatia. He's trying to, he's trying to head it off at the pass. And that's why he had to write before making specific travel plans. And that's why so much of the language about justification is similar to that of the letter to the Galatians, because the same thing is on the table. The same argument is coming up. How do you get saved is it by is it by your righteousness or god's righteousness or in in christ how how does grace work how does sin operate these are all the big questions that he's coming up against and where is the gospel within the righteousness of god okay but there's one big difference between romans and galatians Paul had been to Galatia. He, he'd started the church. They knew him intimately, but Paul's never been to Rome. They don't know him. And so he's speaking to the Romans in a slightly different way than he does to the Galatians. They don't even have a first-hand account of Paul's gospel. So Romans is that. Romans is his full version, but he has to argue his way against the the, the teacher of this paste on the Old Testament. He said, remember when Jesus said, you have heard it said, but I say to you. So Jesus is making a big disjunct between what the Old Testament teaches and what he's teaching. Paul is doing the same thing. He's, he's got this uh, teacher. You see that word that teacher with a capital letter. That's a, a figure of speech to make you think of the, the, program of works righteousness the program of old testament religion that's being pasted on to the gospel paul's trying to deal with that problem and so according to campbell i mean the problem is that the, that teacher that influence is there but paul isn't so paul's solution according to campbell is to use this technique of uh, diatribe and that includes a statement of the opponent's position, often with a speech in character, putting things in the words of the adversary. And that's generally an oral performance. That's something that you can do. You can even use different voices. It's like saying, you have heard it said, but I say to you. And so you're sort of saying, or, or like John does in 1 John when he, when he says, if you say you have no sin, so there are some people who say you have no sin. If you say, then the truth is not in you, you know, and so he goes on if, if, if. So he's picking up an opponent's point of view and then denying it from a gospel point of view. So this is a formidable task. And it's like Jesus saying, you have heard it said, the opposite point of view, but I say to you, the gospel point of view. I don't know if you've ever done a debate, maybe when you were at school or maybe even later, and you have a, a pro and a con, you have a for position and against position, and they take it in turns, maybe they get a five minute speech, and somebody adjudicates in the middle and before the vote is taken, uh, you have a, a note for the, you might say for the prosecution, one for the defense, uh, and you have a, a thesis, and it's as if one person is doing the debate and he takes the for position and then he takes the against position so it's like paul is presenting a formal debate and arguing both sides 
And so Campbell argues that Romans chapter 8, verse 18 to 32. Now read it through because this is really uh, important, very important. So, and think of the subject matter so before you understand what I'm saying here. So that whole portion of the chapter represents Paul's speech in character presentation of the opposing teacher's basic theology. And the words wrath of God represent the heart of their disagreement. They're saying, no, God is angry against sin. And this is what it looks like. God's punishment is going to be retribution. And Paul is going to work his way to saying, no, God's answer is transformation, not retribution. We'll get to it. Here we go. And this is, I'm going to quote from Campbell here. In short, Paul seems to be stating in verse 18 in a suitably pompous manner that the initial and essential content of the opposing teacher's position is a vision of the future wrath of God, of God as retributively just. And Paul does not think that this is the essential nature of God, of the God of Jesus Christ. So he contrasts the teacher's programmatic theological claim quite deliberately with the initial enclosure of his own position, his gospel, which speaks of the saving intervention of God and hence of the divine compassion. Paul stating here that fundamentally different conceptions of God are at stake in these two gospels. And moreover, it's immediately apparent that the teacher's conception has no significant input from Christology. Isn't that good that you saw that? It has no significant input from Christology. The stylistic parallel, therefore, denotes a deliberate contrast between two quite different theological programs. Okay. Are you with me so far? This is really, really key. Okay. But think of it, think of it just in this way, in a, in a simplistic way, in a simplistic way. Think of God's love comes first. God's love is manifested in his justice. His justice is not tempered by his love. His love comes first. Love is the essential quality of God. God is love. Those that live in him live in love. Love one another. Love your neighbor. Love the Lord with all your heart and love your neighbor. You know, this is so cardinal, so straightforward in the teaching of Jesus that when we come to verse 18, it's something like a jar. And Campbell is taking that head on and explaining okay so the two programs in a nutshell i know i'm being simplistic but not that much in these two programs in a nutshell are a choice between understanding god's justice as retributive or transformative and that is the point retribution if you do the crime if you do the crime, you've got to do the time. Retribution means punishment. Transformation means change, means internal moral change. So it's really good. It's very helpful because Paul's subsequent solo use of wrath now becomes a contrast with that typical use of the wrath of God. Paul says wrath because the most crucial and obstinate consequence of our idolatry is, listen, the wrath that we inflict on one another. So he trots out the teacher's favorite forms of Gentile idolatry, and now he turns to the form of idolatry that only an idolatrous, anti-idolatrous person can commit. Mm -hmm. Wrathful judgment against other people's idolatry. Think that through. Pause and go back. Talk it through in your head. And therefore, so the key sentence that hinges all this understanding is Romans chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And you see that little word, therefore, at the beginning. Therefore, you have no excuse. So this is made explicit. This, this diatribe pattern is made explicit in the therefore, which immediately follows this passage. You have no excuse, whoever you are, Jew or Gentile, 
when you judge others for impassing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, are doing the very same thing. You say, we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is in accordance with truth. So this is now, Paul is now taking the other viewpoint. He's moving to the other side of the table. He's countering judgmentalism. He's countering this point that Jesus made on multiple occasions. And when we judge others, in other words, it is its own form of idolatry. We're setting ourselves and our opinions, our intellects, we're setting our, our sense of rightness up against, against God's revealed love. And we portray our judgment as God's judgment. And so a little later on in verse five, Paul deduces the consequences of this idolatry. By your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So wrath is simply wrath here, no longer the wrath of God, because it can instead be seen to be the wrath that we store up for ourselves due to our idolatry of righteous violence on the day of wrath namely the time when our our deeds come home to roost god's righteous judgment will be revealed precisely as something different from our wrath it'll be revealed as a love that reaches out in grace as a free gift in faith romans chapter 3 21 to 26 even to us even to sinners even to god's enemies romans chapter 5 8 to 10 those who refuse the faith of christ namely faithfulness to an unconditionally loving god will continue to live in faithfulness to the false gods of our own wrath and so will end in that wrath makes me think of a line from the message when taking up the words of Jesus saying, saying, if you live your lives squinty eyed in distrust, isn't that amazing? <laughs> if you live your life this way, you end up this way. You are storing something up for yourself. The way that you deal out judgment to others is the way that you deal out judgment to yourself. Okay. And it might be said on the, that on the day of wrath, the alternative will finally be clear to us, non-violence or non-existence. Either we seek the righteous, forgiving, non-violent judgment of God that we experience in Jesus Christ, or we're handed over to the logical end of our own wrathful, violent judgments on one another and the wrathful gods we use to, to justify them. So we have to check the Greek here. And you remember a moment ago, I said that if it, it comes in 12 times, this word orge, but only once does it say orge theo. The other times it just says orge. OK, so Paul's reworking of wrath is such an important matter that consider the other instances of the word wrath in Romans. And we have to challenge the really bad mistranslations in the NRSV, the words of God wrath of God as translated are not there they're not there in the original Greek text the translators inserted them and so they provide inadvertently an illustration of the idolatry of interpreting our human wrath and the violence connected with that as of God the very thing that Paul was speaking against so here we're arguing that Paul is trying to work towards the opposite insight, that we would finally see human wrath, which we've formerly seen as of God, as of us instead. Look at Romans chapter three, verse five. If our injustice serves to confirm the justice of God, what should we say? That God is unjust to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. Now, in this bit, inflicting wrath is explicitly connected with God. Yes, but Paul makes it explicit that this is, this is precisely a human way of thinking. 
That is to say, it's idolatry. And you can't really imagine a more direct presentation of the thesis here. Paul asks about God's justice, whether it can be seen in terms of God inflicting wrath on us. And then he explicitly tells us that seeing things in these terms is our human way of thinking, a worldview deeply ingrained in our humanness, not in God's nature. But in the twisted way, we understand <laughs> God's nature. Wow. What about uh, Romans chapter 9, 22? This needs a lot of thought. Listen to this. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience the objects of wrath that are made for destruction? The translation implies wrath of God by giving us his wrath, referring to God. But once again, the translators have added what isn't there in the Greek. Technically, the first his, the altu in the Greek, is not there, yielding a more literal translation as desiring to show the wrath and to make known his power. So we could argue the following meaning. What if God desiring to show the human wrath and to make known his power has endured the objects of wrath made for destruction. The objects of wrath, like the whip, the crown of thorns, the nails, the cross. In other words, the wrath and his power are not being joined, but contrasted. God has made known his power as distinct from human wrath, precisely by enduring in Jesus Christ, the typical objects of our wrathful judgment. That's what retributive, wrathful judgment looks like. What Jesus underwent. One more aspect to think of here, going back to, to chapter 1, 18, on that passage through to 320, and reading from Robert Hamilton Kelly, a slightly older scholar writing on the same point. The wrath revealed in the gospel is not the divine vengeance that should have fallen on us, falling instead on Jesus. That's the transaction side. But rather the divine non-resistance of human evil. Matthew 5, 39. God's willingness to suffer violence rather than to defend himself or retaliate. It is. Listen carefully. It's the permission granted us by God to afflict ourselves unknowingly. It's the divine non-resistance to human evil. It is God's unwillingness to intervene in the process of action and consequence in the human world by which we set up and operate the system of sacred violence. And so, paradoxically, a sign of love as the refusal to abridge our freedom and a respect for our choices, even when they're catastrophic, even when they're terribly, terribly bad. God permits us to afflict ourselves unknowingly. That's what free will is, isn't it? In contrast to our violent wrath, God reveals his power as non-violent love. God reveals God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. God is revealing what non-violent love looks like. That's the power of God. Love which suffers violence rather than inflicts violence. It's the opposite. It's the opposite of the way that we take it. And the way of Jesus, then, is the way of nonviolence. Disciples of God's power in Jesus Christ live that out, live out the way of nonviolence. And nonviolence is clearly the heart of Jesus's faith, the faith by which he was able to endure the violence of our wrath, because it's faith in the power of God's unconditional love. It was a power that manifested itself on Easter morning as the very power of life behind creation itself. And that's a faith that the power of human violence can never ultimately defeat God's power of life. Amen. Amen. It's abridged. And there's the reference that I'm drawing this from. 
want you to think about this and to come back to me and, and answer that question. Answer that simple question. How do we understand the cross? Is it retribution or transformation? Is it transaction or change? How does the cross impact my life? Because all these things are connected questions and we're going to go on to them next week in our, in our gathering. Okay, may God bless you. May, may Lord, Lord renew our minds, challenge the way we think and help us to stay with minds like plowed furrows ready to receive the rain and the seed and to grow and flourish and develop in our knowledge of you and in the way that we live before you in holiness and humility, in gentleness and in love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Join us next time and we're going to take this session a lot further as we look into Romans chapter uh, one with there's still more to say. So join us then. Good to see you. May God bless you.